E. Lieberman and David Reich in conversation with Tony Joseph, and it's presented by the Business Standard. Daniel E. Lieberman is the Edwin M. Lerner II Professor of Biological Sciences in the Department of Human Evolutionary Biology at Harvard University. He has published two books and over 150 papers on human evolution. David Reich is a Harvard professor who was named one of 10 people who matter in all of science by Nature magazine in 2015. His 2018 book is Who We Are and How We Got Here, Ancient DNA and the New Science of the Human Past. And moderator Tony Joseph has been a journalist for over three decades and is the author of Early Indians, the story of our ancestors and where we come from. Please join me in uh, welcoming to the stage Daniel E. Lieberman, David Reich, and Tony Joseph for this session presented by Business Standard. Good evening, everyone. We, are, uh, we have an exciting hour ahead of us with a conversation between two outstanding scientists from Harvard University who have thrown new light on how evolution has shaped two things most important to us, the human body and the human population and society. Professor Daniel Lieberman is a world-renowned paleoanthropologist and evolutionary biologist who knows more than anyone else about the human body, why it has evolved the way it has, and what happens when we ignore the lessons evolution has taught it. If you haven't read Lieberman's book, The Story of Our Bodies, which came out in 2013, you probably did not know a lot many things that you ought to know. Daniel broke a number of myths about fad diets like paleo diets, and provided a lot of insight into how we should behave if we are to be in harmony with our, the way that our bodies are designed. Professor David uh, Rigg, on the other hand, is a world-renowned geneticist who built the most scaled-up ancient DNA lab at Harvard six years ago, and thus kick-started the almost radical, breathtaking rewriting of human prehistory in continent after continent in collaboration with other geneticists around the world. His work has already changed much of what we know about our own prehistory in India. We know far more about how human societies and populations came to be thanks to the work of, uh, uh, of David and his colleagues. For good or bad, whenever population genetics is in the news, the man in the hot seat is David and uh, David's book, Who We Are and How We Got Here, it was published last year, and is an amazing account of how ancient DNA has changed everything about prehistory. What joins these two very different disciplines is a, genet is a genetic understanding of human history, starting from hundreds of thousands of years ago. Events that happened long ago are still reverberating in the way our bodies are built, and in the way our societies are constructed. The starting point for this conversation will be the discovery uh, of, of ancient DNA and, the, uh, and, 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 the, and then the analysis of ancient DNA, the first ancient DNA in 1997. This has changed uh, the way that we understand the radical develop, new developments. So I would ask Daniel to kick off the discussion by talking about how much uh, we resemble or differ from our evolutionary cousins like Neanderthals. And um, 
David will then talk about his own role uh, in the discovery of the fact that we all carry uh, as a little bit of Neanderthal ancestry within us. Mostly this will be a conversation between two scientists and I will intervene to the extent that is necessary to keep the conversation intelligible to the rest of us commoners and to nudge it along paths that addresses some of the common questions that we have. This is a discussion about the science of ancient DNA and the progress it has made in the last few years. We will d deep dive into some of, this, some of the issues that come up in these discussions later on Sunday the 27th when we will be having conversations with each of them on their own findings and disciplines separately. This discussion will last uh, about 40 minutes and will be followed by a question and answer session. So if you would be helpful if you jotted down the points you want to raise as you listen to this discussion because the sharper and sh shorter the questions are, the more questions we can get answers to. So uh, let's start with uh, Daniel, the state of the science in 1997. Well, thank you, Tony, and thank you, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here in Jaipur. Let me set the stage for you by, 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 by going back just a few years to 1997, when I was a, a, a junior faculty, a first, you know, I just started my job as a professor, and uh, I woke up one morning and opened the New York Times, and there was an article about the first, can you hear me? Okay, the first DNA that came from a Neanderthal. And it was an earth-shattering event. But prior to that moment, we hadn't imagined, uh, people like me at least, that you could get good DNA from a Neanderthal, from a fossil. And prior to that event, <coughs> there had been a huge debate around the world about sort of two completely different views of human evolution. So one idea, which was a very old idea, was that humans evolved in different parts of the world through long and anciently separate lineages. So in Europe, there was a long lineage of humans that evolved from Neanderthals. In Asia, there was a long lineage of humans that evolved maybe from Homo erectus in various parts of Asia. In Africa, the same. Everywhere you went in the world, there were ancient, deep roots of the human species. And starting in, in the, in really in the 1970s, uh, paleoanthropologists started to question that idea and to make the argument that humans came from just Africa. Um, and w one of the biggest revolutions also came from genetic data. In 1987, a very important paper was published based on DNA of living human beings from around the planet. And that paper showed that all of us have roots in Africa. And that, those, that paper com and the data that came later on genetics of people around the world combined with the fossil record, combined with work that people like, uh, like you know, I was doing on how to interpret the fossils, um, really had cemented in everybody's mind the idea that humans recently came from Africa and that when we left Africa sometime less than 100,000 years ago, we encountered other species. Um, well, not we left, some of us left. There are plenty of people still living in Africa, of course. But those who left Africa encountered different species like the Neanderthals in Europe and who knows what in Asia, et cetera. <clears throat> and, and to a paleontologist like me, it was, seemed obvious. If you blindfolded me and gave me a Neanderthal skull and put it on the table in front of me, without any question, I could tell you it was a Neanderthal and completely different from us. Because Neanderthals have a unique set of features that are completely different from any other species. Right? They have you know, certain bumps on the back of their skull and certain shapes of their faces. And, you know, there are all kinds of derived, unique, special features that make Neanderthals distinct. So we think Neanderthals is a separate species, right? And the humans as well have, and this is what work that I've published a lot on, you know, we have skulls that are profoundly different from any other species, structured in a totally different way. So it seemed obvious in 1997 that humans replaced Neanderthals and other archaic humans around the world. And that initial DNA paper that came out in 1997 didn't change that story. But then go 10 years in the future, and I open the New York Times again another day, and there's another argument, and there's another paper, this time based on work by David, showing that Neanderthals and modern humans had interbred using genetic data. And that was really the beginning 
of, of the second part of this revolution. And I'm going to let David finish the story. So hello, I'm David Reich. So I wanted to sort of my, my trajectory as a scientist really starts in 1997. That's when I was doing an internship in a laboratory um, in the UK. And uh, I was just starting in science. I wasn't even sure I would become a scientist. I thought I might become even a science writer, a science journalist, and I applied for an internship at The Economist magazine um, for science writing, and I wasn't successful, but they asked, if you have a good story that you might want to write about, why don't you pitch it to us? And I heard from one of my colleagues that someone had sequenced some DNA from a Neanderthal bone, and so I uh, talked to some people, and I wrote an article for an economist about the sequencing of the Neanderthal genome. It was incredibly exciting. Um, and so that was really the start of my work in science, not as a scientist, but really writing about it and getting a real sense of the thrill of it. Um, after that, I actually worked in a laboratory where the uh, scientists who were teaching me and their scientists who taught them, my academic parents and grandparents, were part of this triumphant discovery of modern human rootedness in Africa, this genetic strand of evidence that combined with the archaeological evidence and the paleontological evidence and other types of evidence, which made it clear that the vast majority of our lines of descent trace their origin within the last 50 to 100,000 years in, into, in roots into Africa. And my direct teachers were part of that, um, d uh, showing that. So over the next few years, I tried to use the very primitive genetic data that we still had access to in the late 1990s and early 2000s when techniques were still about a million times less efficient than they are now for generating genetic data to try to learn what we could about how people are related to each other around the world, how that radiation out of Africa and within Africa happened, um, and that's what I uh, did for a lot of the, 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 my scientific work as well as some other things in medical genetics and discovery of disease genes. Um, so beginning in about 2007, I got the opportunity to work with Svante Pabo, who is a scientist in Germany who invented much of the technology for extracting DNA from ancient bones. And because my, my, my strength was statistical analysis, he invited me and my, my close colleague who I work with, a statistician, to get involved in the analysis of the data from the Neanderthal bones that they were obtaining. Not just the little snippet of DNA that they had obtained in 1997, but now DNA of a quality sufficient to compare at high resolution to people living today. So it became clear already in 2007 that it would be possible to generate such data. And I dropped a lot of the other things I was doing and spent a lot of my own time traveling to Germany, uh, working with colleagues in Germany to try to understand how the Neanderthals were related. This first three set of Neanderthals that we had data from were related to diverse peoples today. So what we tried to do is to ask the question, how do they relate? There was a big open question. Neanderthals lived mostly in Europe. Um, that's where they're best documented, although we now li know they lived all the way in parts of Central Asia and maybe even beyond as well. Um, and they're a very well-documented species or group from an archaeological perspective. And uh, a big question was whether they interbred with modern humans as modern humans spread into their territory, which began happening episodically uh, 150, 100,000 years ago in the Near East, and, maybe, uh, and then happened very dramatically after about 50,000 years ago as people from Africa and the Near East spread through the Near East, dis dis displaced Neanderthals, moved into Europe, and then within a few thousand years, it's now very clear, really displaced Neanderthals entirely between about 41 and 39,000 years ago. So a question was, as modern humans interacted with Neanderthals, and we know they did interact, we know that there's certain sites where there's layers of tools with Neanderthals, and underlying them are layers of tools with modern humans, and underlying them again are Neanderthals, very close in time, even possible cultural interactions with them at some sites, they must have encountered each other. So did they interbreed? This idea gave rise to actually fictional accounts 
uh, account by William Golding in The Inheritor is a novel, um, a more um, popular account uh, by Jean Owl in The Clan of the Cave Bear, books that are very popular about encounters between Neanderthals and modern humans. So what we did with this Neanderthal sequence is we tried to apply to the Neanderthal sequence some tests we had actually developed for studying Indian population history in the last previous last few years. So I will talk about the work on India on Sunday with Tony, who's a specialist on this as well. Um, but what we had done is develop tests for mixture. And our test was, does a Neanderthal uh, genome, does it more closely match non-Africans or Africans, or two different pairs of non-African populations? And when we compared pairs of non-African populations to each other, they were all about equally related to Neanderthals. The genome sequences were all equally close about, more or less. If we compared an African to a non-African, non-Africans were much more, or significantly more closely related to Neanderthals than were non-Africans. And this was a huge shock to us because I came from the school that was uh, believed that Neanderthals were completely replaced. And we tried to make this signal go away, to try every sorts of statistical technique we could to show that this was an artifact. But every way we looked at the data, not just the way I told you about before, but multiple other ways as well, it made it very clear that Neanderthals had contributed some genetic material, about 2% overall, to non -pe to people outside of Africa today, and very little to people within Africa. And since that time, I've been focused on using ancient DNA to learn about the past. So maybe Dan could continue um, up to that uh, point. Yeah, David, uh, one question. Is there a reason why the uh, Neanderthal ancestry has persisted? There must have been some advantage that, that, do we have an idea of what that is? Sure, so today people, uh, outside of Africa carry about 2% Neanderthal ancestry. It's a little higher in South Asians and East Asians than it is in Europeans, even though it's in, Europe, in Europe where the Neanderthals mostly lived, which is quite interesting. Um, but at the time that Neanderthals mixed with humans, the populations probably had a larger proportion of Neanderthal ancestry than they do now. Um, and we know that because we can see in looking in our DNA that near genes and other parts of our genomes that are biologically most important, there is less Neanderthal ancestry than there, wa than you, than there is far away from genes. And what this means without a question is that Neanderthal DNA has been cleaned out of our genomes because it's been slightly toxic to our genomes. And so people who carry Neanderthal genes in parts of our genome that do things that are important, those people weren't as successful, were not as successful in having offspring. And over time, the approximately 2,000 generations that have passed since this interbreeding occurred, the Neanderthal ancestry has tended to be removed. So even though only 2% of our DNA comes from Neanderthals, you might think that means that several thousand generations ago, only two out of every hundred of your ancestors are Neanderthals. Actually, the truth, if you're a non-African person, is more like 10 or 15 out of 100 of your ancestors at that time depth are Neanderthals. It's just the bits of DNA that those, Neanderthal those ancestors passed down to you or tried to pass down to you were not as successful in the competition to get into you as the ones from modern human ancestors. And what's left tend to be the parts that are not as biologically important. And so we're tolerated in the organism with some exceptions where key mutations that Neanderthals carried, perhaps to allow them to adapt to the non-African environments in which they had lived for hundreds of thousands of years, were picked up by modern humans and allowed modern humans to do a little better in those environments to which Neanderthals were pre-adapted, but with mo which mo modern humans, which are an African origin group, had not yet encountered. But you know, what's fascinating about this, for, there are many fascinating things about this, but I'm sure many of you wonder, what does it mean to have 2% of my genome be Neanderthal, right? Uh, that's, a, that's a common question I get. And, and I think there's important things to think about. So from a, just from a species level perspective, from a paleontological evolutionary perspective, some people have suggested that means that Neanderthals and modern humans actually aren't separate species. We're all human beings. And, to one extent, I would agree that Neanderthals are a, are a kind of human. They're, their brains were as large of us as, they're, you know, they're from the same age. They were very competent, brilliant, successful hunter-gatherers in many ways who were capable of doing the same things that modern humans were doing at the same time. But on the other hand, 
if any of you were Neanderthal in the audience, even from here with the stage lights, I could probably tell that you would be profoundly different than any of you actually are, right? You would stick out like a sore thumb. There are, there are, there are many profound differences, and, and, and we can show that even though there was interbreeding between Neanderthals and modern humans, thanks to David's work and others, and others like Svante Pabo, it, that, that hasn't had much of an effect, and in, and in effect, when we look at other closely related species, we see the same phenomenon. For example, we know that in, in Africa, there are many different species of, of baboons. Uh, there are many species of all kinds of monkeys. And we know that those species often interbreed on an occasion, but those offspring of those interbreeding events, the same thing happens that David just described. The, the, the percentage of one versus the other uh, ancestry seems to decline rapidly because there are negative consequences to that interbreeding. The offspring have less what we call biological fitness. And it, the same occurs, appears to be the case with Neanderthal. So I think from a, from, a, from a kind of a philosophical perspective, the evidence that Neanderthals and modern humans interbred doesn't really change, our, uh, to me, the notion that modern humans, that Homo sapiens is a separate species. But nonetheless, we walk around carrying, you know, 2% of our genes that come from Neanderthals. And that has other important and interesting implications um, but to understand that, we also need to understand another vitally important fact, or two important facts. So one of those facts is that the variation that exists in the world, um, most of that variation doesn't exist with, within, uh, between populations, that most of the variation exists within populations. So if, if we were to imagine we were just one population right now, and the rest of the world were suddenly to die in some kind of horrible attack, right? we would still preserve in this room about 86%, 85% of all the genetic variation that exists in our species. Another way of saying that is 85% of the variation, the genetic variation that exists in the world exists in any one, in any one population. So the, 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 the things that make populations different from each other are much less than the things that make us different from each other within a population by about a factor of six. And the other important thing to remember is that those genes have effects on our phenotype, on our bodies, but most of the phenotypes that we, that we carry are complex phenotypes. They're the result of hundreds of genes of a very small effect. They're genes that are rare, um, and they have strong interactions with the environment. So it doesn't mean that 2% you know, of your nose is Neanderthal. It doesn't work that way, um, even if 2% of your genome is, is, is Neanderthal. But I'm going to let David pick up on that, on that issue. Uh, David, I would like to ask one question. In the context of genetic variation, is genetic variation in the modern human population, is it uh, rising, decreasing, is it more homogenizing? What's, what, what is the trend today when you, say, when you look at the long term? Right, so the question, uh, the question is, how is variation changing in humans? Yeah. And I think that one thing to realize is that if we scroll back 50,000, 60,000 years, that the world was a very different place in some sense than it is today. There were at least five groups uh, very mo that, that were separated by many, many hundreds of thousands of years of nearly complete isolation from each other, and in some cases more than a million years. So the ancestors of modern humans, uh, the ancestors of Neanderthals, the ancestors of a group that we haven't talked about but may talk about in this conversation that were discovered by ancient DNA in 2010 called the Denisovans. A second group of Denisovans that we know must have existed because they interbred also with the ancestors of some people in the world living today. And a group that lived on the island of Flores that was still around at least 70,000 years ago. These groups were all living at this time and were separated from each other by many, many hundreds of thousands of years. And within a few tens of thousands of years, we were all alone, our group. And it was a great collapse of human variation, a great loss of human variation compared to what had existed before. That 2% interbreeding of Neanderthals into non-Africans, that 4 to 5% of Neanderthal interbreeding, of, uh, into, of Denisovan interbreeding into the ancestors of people in New Guinea and related groups, that, res that captured a little bit of that ancestry from those groups, but most of it disappeared. So today, um, and for the last 50,000 years, we've been much more homogeneous. 
And in each part of the world, as groups have separated and lived in different parts of the world, in South Asia and East Asia and different parts of Africa and the Americas, and so on, there's been periods of isolation when variation has increased, but variation increases slowly biologically by a very gradual accumulation of mutations and random genetic changes and changes under selection. And then it's homogenized by episodic massive convulsions of mixture that we'll talk about on Sunday in this subcontinent of South Asia. Um, and then separated, then again, periods of stasis and relative less mixture, little, relatively little mixture occurring. So the question of how our variation is heading is an interesting one. Mixture events don't lose variation overall. They just mix it all together. Um, but they do, and so overall the variation in populations today goes up. So if we take DNA, ancient DNA from hunter-gatherers from Europe from 8,000 years ago, they have less variation than anybody living in any population today, including in the Brazilian jungle today. Um, so they have an unprecedentedly low amount of genetic variation, as did Neanderthals, actually. Um, but then they mixed with other people to produce much higher variation populations, and that variation is all in us uh, today in various proportions, depending on what population you're from. And, and I think another, to add to that, is that people often think that because of the modern world, because of medicine, because of airplanes, because of uh, uh, you know, agriculture and, and refrigeration and antibiotics and things like that, that selection has stopped, that almost that evolution has ceased to exist. And I hope I can dissuade you of that notion because if you think, if, if you, uh, natural selection is really the byproduct of three things, right? It's, it's the byproduct of, of ancestry and heritable variation so that you have, you know, you inherit similarities from your parents. That's part one. Second, there's variation. And, and you know, that variation, of course, as we said, is heritable. Some of it is heritable. And finally, differential reproductive success, sometimes caused by competition. You know, I have one child, and you may have two, and Tony may have three, I have no idea. But the point is that we all leave different numbers of offspring to the next generation. And if there's any genetic basis for any of that, and, there, and we know there is, that means that natural selection is always going to happen. It's still happening right now. It's ticking along because it's natural selection is nothing more than the outcome of those three things, her variation, heritability, and differential reproductive success. So we can't, it's very hard to predict where things are going, but people are trying to measure it. So for example, outside of Boston, there's a very famous town called Framingham where for three generations now, we've been tracking the genes of those individuals in that population and we can, and, and, the, and the, the population's big enough and the statistical methods are good enough that we can actually show there's been slight, very slight, very small, but nonetheless measurable and detectable selection in that population. So for example, women who are slightly shorter and slightly plumper have had a reproductive advantage over the last generation. Very, 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 very slight. Now that doesn't mean that that's gonna happen in the next generation, I mean the, 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 the pendulum you know, could swing back in the other direction and maybe taller women will do better in the next generation. But the point is selection is still going on today. But it's going on in a gigantic eight billion species, you know, individual species um, in which our environments have shifted dramatically, changing the kind of selection that's going on. So one of the things I wanted to give you a flavor of with what we're doing with ancient DNA and to sort of take you a little bit um, on a... Uh, uh, on what's happened in the last 10 years or not eight years since the first genome-wide data from Neanderthals and uh, 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 other humans was produced is that there's been a vast increase in the amount of ancient DNA data available. From the first genome sequences published in 2010, which was five individuals, we're now at more, at more than 2,000 published genome sequences. There's been this super exponential rise in the number of whole genome data sets from humans. I've retooled my entire laboratory beginning in 2013 to generate such data and interpret it to learn about the past. And one of the things that we can do with ancient genomes is to actually study how, bio, how biology or how genetic tr variations that affect biology have changed over time. And so, for example, we in our laboratory have generated data from several thousand people, not all of it published already, from Europe 
from the last 10,000 years, from the hunter-gatherers of Europe who were there before farming got to Europe after 9,000 years ago, to the first farmers who were there between eight and a half thousand years ago and about 5,000 to 4,000 years ago, to the new ancestry that came in from the steppe north of the Black and Caspian Seas, and is a important, important component of the ancestry of Europe today and also actually of South Asia. These three components of ancestry, um, we can track them in time and see the frequency of genetic variations and how they change over time. And we can do something that we couldn't do before the advent of ancient DNA, which is to watch the experiment of evolution rolling forward in time. Dan talks about the Framingham Heart Study, a beautiful study in three generations. But here is a study of many hundreds of generations where we can watch what happened over time. And for example, we can watch we can see that the people from the steppe north of the Black and Caspian Sea, we know of what the genetic variations are that affect height, people's total stature in Europeans. And we can tell that those people were genetically selected to be taller, or rather perhaps the ancestors of European farmers were genetically selected to be shorter in the time since those two groups separated. So we can watch that change over time and track it over time. We can watch the ability to digest cow's milk, whose basis we know in Europe evolve over time from its near absence in the population before 4,000 years ago to its rapid rise in frequency in the population after 2,000 years ago. So we can document for the first time this experiment of nature occurring um, in these large sample sizes we have available. And that's potentially one of the most exciting things about ancient DNA in addition to the information it conveys about migrations, the ability to watch biological evolution happening over a time that's long enough for natural selection to have quite meaningful average effects. Uh, one question. You know, today we have the, pop the population is, is many multiple of what it used to be a few centuries ago. So the field in which uh, selection happens is far larger. So is probably the number of situations in which human beings today find themselves, partly because the changes they themselves have made. Would it therefore be correct to say that the evolutionary pressure today is higher, taking both these factors into account, than earlier, or, or is it the other way around? Well, I mean, it, it's a mixed bag. It's a complicated story. So, for example, one thing, if you have, all of us have mutations. Like, all of us in this room, I have, I think, about, a, I think the average is about 100 per person. Is that am I right? Less, actually, the mutation, but yes, it, approximately a few dozen. Yeah, okay, but all of us have a sum of mutations, and only a fraction of those mutations are expressed in our, in, our, in our bodies in a way that selection can act on. When you have just, you know, 20,000, 30,000 people in the world, that means you have not that much variation for selection to operate on. When you have 8 billion people, that's a heck of a lot of variation that suddenly natural selection can act upon. So that's, that's in a way, a, 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 a way to make things, to, to, to supercharge things. But on the other hand, when you have an enormous population of 8 billion people spread around the, around the globe and you have a gene that might be really good for you, right? that gene is going to have a hard time. It's going to take a long time for it to spread throughout the population. So that's going to slow things down. So it's a complicated mixed bag. And I don't think there's a simple answer. David, David, David might want to elaborate. Well, there's an interesting idea related to this, which is that so there's about 3 billion positions, 3,000 3, million positions in our DNA, where there are DNA letters, the four DNA letters, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. Um, and given that each of us has a few dozen mutations every generation, in a population of a few tens of thousands, not all of those DNA letters will change every generation. But in this time, when there's 8 billion people, 8 billion people times dozens of mutations hits tens of billions of positions, but that's way more than we have in our genome. So every position in our genome that can be mutated does get mutated every generation now. So that means we are in what's called a saturation mutagenesis experiment. Every mutation that's simple, that can occur, does occur multiple times. And if there is some incredibly valuable mutation that's going to do something important, it's occurred multiple times and is available for natural selection to act. So if in our ancient past, 100,000 years ago, we were at what's called a, in a mutation-limited state, 
there were sufficiently few people that valuable mutations that could in theory occur actually were not occurring and you would have to wait many, many dozens or even hundreds of generations for them to by chance occur. Now they're all occurring every generation and so the grist for evolution is there and if there's something advantageous, it will occur every generation multiple times and be pushed up by the pressure of natural selection. So we're in a profoundly different state. Now how that affects our evolution is unclear. In fruit flies, when people study evolution, being in a mutation non-limited state where population sizes are big has profound consequences. But, but there's another twist, of course, which is that mutations have effects in particular environments, right? So, so genes are expressed but that, the, the, the expression of that gene is often environmental dependent. Your bodies are a complex interaction between the genes you inherited and the environments in which you live. And so one of the big shifts today is that, um, that, is that we're changing our environments more rapidly than ever happened uh, in our human evolutionary history. Um, and I'm not just talking about climate change, which is also a big issue, um, but also just the fact that we change in our environments in terms of diet, in terms of, look, I'm looking around you, all of you are sitting in chairs. If we had been here a few generations ago, there'd be almost no chairs in this part of the world with backs, because people didn't sit in chairs with backs. I could go on and on and on, the shoes you're wearing, the clothes you're wearing, the foods you're eating. We've changed our environments profoundly, and so, that creates interesting dynamic, which we call the mismatch dynamic, right? So if, when you have a gene that evolved for a particular environmental condition, and all of a sudden you change the environment, that's an opportunity for selection to occur. Now that happened in the past, when modern humans, for example, left Africa and moved into temperate uh, Eurasia, all of a sudden they were encountering new pathogens, new foods, new climatic conditions. And that resulted in selection on skin color and on, on immune systems and on the ability to handle various kinds of diets. But that, was a, that happened, and that's a very important engine of evolution. But think about the, envi the environmental changes we're doing to our bodies today. Compare your life now with your life 20, 30, 40 years ago, or your grandparents or your great-great-grandparents. Just think how different those environments are. So in one way, we're increasing the environmental mismatch that's available. But in another way, we also can temper that because we have medicine. If you get diabetes and you may have it, there's a genetic basis that, you know, that makes you more likely to have diabetes, you can go and get a pill from a doctor that helps you deal with it. So it's very, very hard to parse out, you know, what are the environmental shifts that are pushing evolution and what are the environmental shifts that are breaking evolution? But there's no question it's still going on. It's going on in a way that we're still struggling to understand. Can you help us get a sense of how slow evolution is in terms of selection? Because people often think that, you know, we have been doing this for a very long time. We must have selected. So how slow is evolution? Oh, my gosh. Well, let's see. There's two ways of thinking about it. One way is I'll give you the phenotypic answer, and David will give you the genotypic answer. How about that? So in terms of phenotype, evolution um, can, is generally extremely slow. Um, but, but small changes can sometimes have a big effect. So um, um, for the most part, our bodies are still basically the bodies that we have of hunter-gatherer ancestors. You know, we've been a farming in this, on this, in the world, farming has gone on for about 600 generations. To give you an equivalent, that's about the number of generations that have come and gone since the time of, say, Jesus, or, you know, that's not very long, right? Um, and so that's, uh, that's and, and yet, even in that time period, we know that farming has had profound consequences on our selection, right? We've changed, for example, the ability to, to digest milk and, and, and so on. But on the other hand, um, um, beyond those shifts, we still have the bodies basically of hunter-gatherers. It's just a tiny fraction of the genome that's been selected upon and a tiny amount of our phenotype that's changed. Not that they're not important, they are important. So. Selection is slow and evolution is slow, but let's get a, let's get a genetic perspective on that. Yeah, it's super interesting because um, the genetic variation that we have inherited from our parents is really the genetic variation you expect from a population of about size 10,000 people. And the reason, the population that existed 100,000 years ago, and the reason for that is that, um, is that it takes a very long time for a, a population of humans or other animals to change in response to uh, evolutionary pressure and changes in population size. And so um, 
So for example, we are right now a population of 8 billion people, and the amount of time it will take to get to our new equilibrium state, where our genetic variation looks like what you might expect from a population of 8 billion, is 8 billion times 2, so that's 16 billion times 30, the number of generations, years, so that is about 50 billion years, three times the age of the universe until we're going to equilibrate. And that seems like a long time. So, um, so in fact, we're on the way to getting there, but we're actually much closer to where we were with our ancestors uh, 100,000 years ago. And so we're stuck like with the variation that our ancestors had on the way on a very long journey to being equilibrated. So it's like a freight liner that's heading toward a big ship or a tanker that's heading toward a little something and trying to stop. It's very slow. It's going to be very hard to turn. And so, you know, after agriculture comes in the Near East or in China or in South Asia, you have a few thousand years to patch the body, you know, adapt to be able to digest some cow's milk or some carbohydrates you know, change your limb proportions a little bit, change your skin color a little bit. But these are just like little patches are on, on our hunter-gatherer biology. And it's a really slow process for biological evolution to affect things. And cultural evolution, on the other hand, is incredibly rapid, as you can see in our lifetimes, and uh, results in very much more profound changes. So we have this extreme mismatch between the speed with which our the evolutionary process, profound as it is, is able to adapt to new environments and the rapidity with which our environments, both ecologically imposed and self-imposed through our cultural evolution, are changing. And it's sort of an interesting state we find ourselves in as a species. Just to add to that one more point, which is that remember, most of the traits that you have that have a genetic basis or a partly genetic basis um, are complex traits with many, many genes underlying them. So that means, for example, height. For David mentioned height. Height is a, is a, is a phenotype, is a trait that's, a, that's highly heritable. If your parents are tall, you're likely to be tall. If your parents are short, you're likely to be short. But there are, there's a debate going on exactly just how many genes there are that are involved in height. But, but the, the number is in the hundreds. And you know, I think the one that has the biggest Thousands. effect on height. Yeah. Thousands. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm trying to be. I'm trying to be. Con I'm trying to be uh, conservative here, <laughs> but, but but there are some who argue it's anyway. The, you don't need to go Tens into the debate. Thousands. But anyway, um, the point is that the, the the gene that has the most effect, the biggest gene that anybody's ever been able to find, is at like about two percent. Um, so it's, it's not, there, there, there's no big gun genes out there that are easily acted upon by selection to create rapid change. It can happen, but it's not easy. It's very hard, and for the vast majority of, of the traits that we care about, um, it's, uh, it, it, there, th that's another constraint on the rapidity with which evolution can occur. Why, why is it wrong to have, uh, you know, things such as, there, you know, we were hunter gatherers, and therefore the paleo diet is what we need. What's wrong with uh, many of these fire diets? What mistake do they make? Oh, well, very simple. So the idea behind the paleo diet is that we should eat what our, our, our cavemen ancestors ate, right? That's basically a caricature of it. And the reason why that's a very dangerous way of thinking is that what were our cavemen ancestors adapted for? Right? What's, what's, what does natural selection care about? It cares about one thing and one thing only, which is how many offspring you have who survive and reproduce. It doesn't care if we're happy. It doesn't care if we're nice. It doesn't care if we're healthy. It only cares if we're healthy insofar as health promotes reproductive success. So if our ancestors ate a particular diet, that diet was presumably selected for, uh, to some extent, or our bodies were selected to handle that diet because it helped increase our reproductive success, not our health. A second problem is like, which paleo diet are you going to pick, right? If you, if, you, if you went to the Hadza in Tanzania, you'd pick one diet. But if you went to you know, the hunter-gatherers who were living 20,000 years ago in the Middle East, you'd pick another diet. If you picked the hunter-gatherers who were living here in India, you'd find another diet. There was no one paleo diet. There were thousands of different paleo diets. And so there is no, there's no ur paleo diet to even pick in the first so place. So what you're saying is that the, the, the hunter-gatherer was optimized for being Generalists. Yeah. Generalists rather yeah. than. Yeah, exactly. Uh, is it, I think we have had a very fascinating discussion, and I think I would like to open it up for uh, questions from the audience.
uh, namaste welcome to india uh, i actually wanted to ask like uh, we are evolving now in what humans look like say a billion years as you said long back we're not the same so what do you think how we humans going to look say at 10 billion years from now Are you you're asking what we're going to look like 10 million years from now? Is it something like these cartoons these days are portraying with big human heads and small body, <laughs> something like that? <laughs> I uh, I have no idea when I when I when I think about that sometimes I I don't even let my mind go there. I think we're putting ourselves in such to such an extreme ecological and climatic and you know Malthusian population state that I think that any idea that we're going to be maintained in a situation like we are in now for a long period of time like hundreds or even thousands or even tens of thousands of years is highly unlikely there's going to be some massive disaster and i i think it's going to be hard to project behind that disaster but, but remember the, the 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 dynamics of selection aren't going to change right so when people imagine big brain sort of aliens of the future right you know they they're, they're actually they're telling us something about what we think is really special about human beings which is our big brain <laughs> but I actually can tell you right now that bigger that that brains have actually been getting smaller not bigger in in our recent evolutionary past i mean our brains are pretty big but any bigger is not going to necessarily be any better in fact think about the problems it would cause for giving birth you know everybody would have to have a c section for example so so um we we need to be really it's interesting um 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 i think i i think our fantasies about or that you sometimes read about what what people are going to be like in the future because of selection tell us much more about our own conceptions of ourselves than any scientific information thank you Hi, good evening. Big fan of both of yours work. I think this uh, JLF is basically I've come in here just to listen to the two of you. But just wanted to understand the kind of work that the two of you are doing. What do you think is the impact of that on selective deliberate selective breeding that is going to probably take place? See, phenotypical breeding has always been the case. But now with the kind of work that you're doing, is there going to be selective breeding deliberately genotypically? Am I am I clear with my question? Does that Yeah, that's a very important question. So, what are the I think that maybe you're asking for a questions or what are the potential uses and abuses of genetic data to guide breeding and mix and and decisions about um who to who to interbreed with and uh, even among couples uh, which of their uh, eggs and sperm to 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 choose and and even how to modify them. and as the technologies to do this become more powerful and they are rapidly becoming more powerful and arguably not uh, quite there in a lot of respects um it's 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 scary and also important to think about the ethical issues associated with that there was recently a conference in hong kong where it was announced it was announced that there was a a genetically engineered human baby um with an engineering that was not necessarily a good engineering and that baby is going to be potentially cursed for the rest of its life with uh this these changes and so these are things we have to think about profoundly if we're going to play god with uh with with genetics of course we do play god with the genetics of domesticated animals and we're already using genetics to guide interbreeding of 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 animals and so it's just interesting to think about all of this but but the notion of of breeding human beings in a artificial selection i find so chilling because um because it's disrespectful of people's rights to make their own decision and i do hope that i mean from an ethical perspective there are there's so many ethical landmines um about about the reproductive risks and the harms not just to particular individuals but to the species as a whole but but most fundamentally um it's it's there's an ethical dilemma not dilemma there's a, there's a, i think a very clear bright ethical line about you know to what extent is it is it appropriate to 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 take you know to 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 remove from individuals their 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 right to make decisions about about how they want to reproduce i i hope we never ever ever cross that line i hope so too No, I was uh, very carefully reading 
the summing up of uh, your studies by tony joseph my name is kancha ilaya i do write on cultural issues and you made a very important point that cultural variation can have a much uh, sharper impact on human body and natural selection does it mean that the cultural valuation like you know caste value variations in india does it have more impact on human adoption and knowledge growth and development on human system than the, in a system where such an institution was not there so, oh i think the answer to that question is unquestionable that cultural evolution is a far more powerful and rapid force than biological evolution. Um, and, you know, we even know that from the past. If, if you went back in time and tried to, to you know, think about the, the cultural shifts that have occurred since agriculture or since the Industrial Revolution or even now the, the web and the technological changes that are occurring in our life, there's no genetic mutations that underlie any of those, those shifts. There was no gene that suddenly got people to figure out how to invent the wheel or, or farm lentils or rice or wheat. Uh, there was no gene that gave us the internet, right? So, so there's no question that cultural evolution is far outstripping biological evolution as a force of change. But there's also no question that there's a dynamic, there's an interaction. This is called sometimes dual inheritance theory. Cultural evolution can then sometimes affect genetic evolution, not to the same degree by any stretch of the imagination. But think of the simple example. When, when humans were first moving out of uh, tropical Africa into temperate Eurasia, right? They suddenly were encountered environments like today where it was really cold, right? And, 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 um, the, and the ability to have clothing and fire and various other you know, housing and various other ways to cope with climate change then enabled selection to ap operate on other aspects of our biology, for example, to tolerate cold differently in one population versus another. So it doesn't mean that, that biological evolution ceases to exist, poof, like that, no. It gives opportunity for new kinds of biological evolution, but nonetheless, you cannot over you cannot overlook the fact that cultural evolution is a far more profound and powerful source of change. Um, hello. So you talked about um, an experiment done on fruit flies in a, in a population where um, the mutations were saturated. And you talked about how it had consequences. So could you please elaborate on that and then explain how that could link to humans and um, the potential dangers that we could face by having um, every gene be mutated and expressed. Right, so um, the, question, the question is, um, uh, how does biological change, how, do, how does a big population size, one way to respond to your question is, how does a big population size affect evolution differently from a small population size? And one way to see the answer to this is that if you have a big population size, almost every mutation that causes an effect will be different because it's originated in a different person. And we see this with rare diseases. So for example, if you look at the mutations that could cause the disease called muscular dystrophy, which is a muscle wasting disease, almost every child who has it has a new mutation that occurred one or two generations ago, which is different from the mutations in all other families. That's because people with this disease don't reproduce almost at all. And so as a result, these mutations don't get passed on and they just occur again a few generations later in some other family. And so what you actually have is a situation where many, many, where instead of a single mutation that occurred a long time ago being responsible for um, this disease or this effect again and again, it's many independent mutations causing it. And so what we're stuck with in, in our life though is we're, having, we're looking at common variations that occurred 200, 300,000 years ago that slightly affect to increase height or decrease height, increase your risk for cardiovascular disease, decrease your risk for cardiovascular disease, and the ones that are shared, our, our risk factors are shared across people, so we have a shared set of genetic variations. So that's the kind of thing that uh, is profoundly different in a mutation-limited and in a mutation-non-limited state. 
lost our microphone guy. Pardon? I think we lost our guy with the microphone. Could someone shout and we'll just answer? <laughs> and I'll repeat your question. Variation, you know, uh, could have had, had that kind of an effect in Neanderthals, and and if you see, say, 600 generations down the lane, so could, could you think that there could be uh, a lot of you know, genetic drift, you know, that is coming, you know, coming from this uh, non-coding regions, you know, taking up taking up the lane. So, so could you could you could you throw those, you know, some of the insights into this? I think your question is about um, what are the consequences, maybe, correct me if I'm wrong, of the genetic variation we get from Neanderthals mostly being from biologically less important regions, less functional regions of the genome. And I think that that's an interesting thing to think about. I mean, one, one, um, if we piece together the pieces of the genome we have from Neanderthals, we tend to have holes where we have nobody today living who has Neanderthal genome sequence in genes, and then we have good coverage of Neanderthal data across everybody outside of genes. Now, I think that probably increases the total amount of genetic variation outside genes relative to within genes, because Neanderthals have not increased our variability if we are non-African people uh, uh, within genes to the same extent as outside of genes because of the Neanderthal input into our population. And so there, that has increased the amount of fluctuation in Ge genetic diversity between uh, biologically important and non-biologically important regions. But what its consequences are is not clear. It's time for two more questions. There's one person. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch established in 2002, in a 2002 paper that the linguistic ab ability that humans have is a unique ability and it comes from recursion. So what would it mean uh, to see that in like in a paleoanthropological way in fossils and genetically how would it what would it mean to discover linguistic ability in a gene if if it is possible to that kind of a study So if I think I understood the question correctly um, uh, the question is really about the genetics behind language is that correct Correct um, So language like like other complex traits is a very complex trait, maybe one of the most complex traits we have. And there's a very vigorous and deep debate still going on about to what extent humans have a different capability in terms of linguistics than, say, other humans, including Neanderthals. And the, it's very hard to study this. One problem is that um, speech doesn't fossilize. So the best evidence that we have comes from the ability to produce sounds with our, with our, with our heads. And, and, and there, there is some compelling evidence that humans might have had the ability to produce, have the ability to produce slightly more articulate, more comprehensible speech than, than Neanderthals. And that has to do with the ratio of the length of your face to the, to the height of your, of your neck. Um, and that has important acoustical effects. But we also have some genetic data. So for example, there's a very famous gene called FOXP2, and, and humans have a derived feature of that gene, which we share with Neanderthals, and Neanderthals also had that. So nobody's arguing that Neanderthals couldn't speak, or the ability to speak completely arose de novo since Neanderthals. It's gonna be a much more complicated story. And, but does anybody actually know the answer to the question that you ask? Absolutely not. Are there a lot of people who think they know the answer? Absolutely. But the science isn't there yet. We, we have a long, long way to go. And it may be one of those unanswerable questions. I don't know. So I just, I know there's, I just want to add a little bit to that. So um, we, um, I, I think Chomsky has, is attracted to the idea that there was a big, that the big leap forward in, or big change in human archaeology that happens 50 to 70,000 years ago, known as the later Stone Age or Upper Paleolithic Revolution, might be related to the use of a much more advanced type of language that evolved at that time or shortly before that time. But that can't be true. And the reason it can't be true is the major diversification of present-day human lineages occurred well before that. So Khoisan, um, groups who are well represented in Southern African hunter-gatherers and lineages represented in Central African 
uh, hunter-gatherers, sometimes called pygmies, separated 200,000 years approximately, largely, from all of the other lineages within Africa and outside of Africa today. What that means is that if you have, and these groups are of course fully, richly, in fact, more able to use a lot of linguistic abilities than are other groups, uh, than groups today. So if you argue that it evolved 50 to 70,000 years ago, which is Chomsky's favorite idea, then it have to evolve in one of these groups, not the others, and yet all of these have these rich linguistic abilities. So that makes you think about that hypothesis. We have totally run out of time. Thank you very much to everybody. You can catch Daniel and uh, uh, David when, when they're outside of the dais. Thank you very much to both of you. Thank you all. Huge thank you to Daniel.